Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel called Statistics from A to Z Confusing Concepts Clarified. These videos are based on content from my book of the same name which was published by Wiley. For more information on the book and these videos please visit statisticsfromatoz.com. This is the third video in a planned playlist on statistical tests. It is on the chi-square test for goodness of fit. You can see here the others in this playlist that I have completed or that I plan to do. If you're not familiar with chi-square as a test statistic, you may want to view my video chi-square, the test statistic and its distributions, before viewing this one. And if you'd like to see the latest status of my videos completed and planned, you can find that at statisticsfromatoz.com slash videos. As usual in the book and in these videos, we'll start by going quickly through a list of keys to understanding, or KTUs. This will end with the highlights of the concept on a single page. And then we'll go into detailed explanations of each of the keys. For this video, there are five KTUs. The first key to understanding tells us that the chi-square test for goodness of fit is a one-way test of a categorical variable also known as a nominal variable. KTU number two says, the test can be used to determine whether observed sample data fit a specified set of values, for example, our estimates, or if they fit a specified discrete or continuous distribution. Key number three says, the test determines whether there is a good fit between the observed O counts from data and the expected E frequencies which we have specified or between the observed counts and a distribution. Key to understanding number four states the null hypothesis, H0, of this test. There is no statistically significant difference between the observed counts and the expected frequencies. Therefore, there is a good fit. The fifth and final KTU gives the formula for the test statistic chi-squared for this test. Chi-squared equals the sum of the squares of the observed minus the expected values. And here on one page are all five keys to understanding the concept of the chi-squared test for goodness of fit. You may wish to pause the video at this point and read them all together. Okay, now let's take an in-depth look at each of the keys to understanding. KTU number one starts out by saying the chi-square test for goodness of fit is a one-way test. Now one way means that a single variable is involved. So this test is less complicated than the chi-square test for independence, which involves two variables. KTU number one goes on to say that it is a test of a categorical variable also known as a nominal variable. The concept of a categorical variable can be confusing, so we'll spend some time to clarify it. Let's start with a concept that we're all familiar with, the numerical variable. The left side of this compare and contrast table gives two examples of this type of variable, weight and temperature. The numerical variable weight can have values that are numbers, for example, 102.4 kilograms. And the numerical variable temperature will also have values that are numbers, for example, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Now let's focus on the right half of this table for non-numerical categorical examples. The values of a categorical variable are not numbers. The values of a categorical variable are names of categories. Nominal is the adjective associated with the word name. So categorical variables are also called nominal variables. For example, gender is a categorical variable and it has two values which are the names female and male. As another example, let's say we were working on improving a process of some type, say a manufacturing process. 
process would be the categorical variable. And we could have two different named processes, the process followed before the improvements and the process after the improvements. So the values of the categorical or nominal variable process would be the two names, before and after. You may wish to pause the video at this point and reread the table, since this concept can be somewhat confusing. Moving on to key number two. The test can be used to determine whether the observed sample of data fits a specified set of values, for example, our estimates, or whether the observed data fit a specified discrete or continuous distribution, for example, whether the data is normal. A number of statistical tests assume that the data is normal, so before using those tests, one must make sure. The chi-square goodness of fit test can be used as an alternative to the Anderson-Darling test for normally distributed data. The chi-square goodness of fit test is unusually versatile and then it can also be used on other continuous distributions as well as on discrete distributions such as the binomial or Poisson. This test is also useful in statistical modeling to determine whether a specified model fits the data. Key number three says, the test determines whether there is a good fit between observed counts, the O's from data, and the expected frequencies, the E's, which we have specified, or between observed counts and a distribution. Here's an example of expected frequencies in the form of percentages. We estimate or state or hypothesize numbers that we have reason to expect would be borne out by any future sample data. It's simpler if we can state our expected numbers in actual counts, but it is often the case that we need to deal in proportions in decimal format or percentages. For example, let's say we're about to open a new tavern and we want to plan staffing levels. We know from past experience that the number of customers varies by days of the week. We don't know how many customers to expect in a week, but we can estimate what percentages to expect each day. And here's what we expect. 12.5% of the weekly total for each of the four days, Monday through Thursday. 30% of our customers will come on Friday and 20% on Saturday. And we're closed on Sundays. And that gives us a total of 100%. Since we will be doing a hypothesis test on the validity of the model represented by these percentages, we start with two things. We state a null hypothesis, more on that later, and we select a value for alpha, most commonly 5%, which gives us a 95% level of confidence in the test. We then open the tavern and we count customers for six days. We observe the counts shown in the second table. Observed counts are actual numbers from the sample data. Counts, by definition, are always non-negative numbers, for example, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Now, to compare the observed counts to the expected percentages, we do not convert observed counts from the sample data into proportions or percentages. This is because counts contain information related to the sample size, and that information would get lost in converting to proportions or percentages. Instead, if needed, multiply the ex expected percentages by the total count to get expected frequencies. These expected frequencies don't have to be integers like counts do. Also, the chi-square test for goodness of fit has certain minimum size requirements, which are the test assumptions. Every expected frequency must be one or greater and no more than 20% of the expected frequencies can be below 5. If either of these assumptions are not met, increasing the sample size will often help. You can see that our sample data in this example easily meet both of these assumptions. Before proceeding with any kind of statistical analysis, always plot the data. If the plot shows that there is obviously no fit then do not proceed with the test. This plot looks like there is a good fit. 
so we can proceed with the chi-square test for goodness of fit. The test will tell us whether the fit is good enough to meet our desired level of confidence. Since the goodness of fit test uses hypothesis testing, the next thing we need to do is to state a null hypothesis for this test. Key to understanding number four gives us our null hypothesis. There is no statistically significant difference between the observed counts and the expected frequencies. Therefore, there is a good fit. Now, this may be confusing at first because we are used to having H0 be a statement of nothingness. There is no difference, no change, or no effect. And now we are saying that it does mean something. There is a good fit. But all a good fit means is that there is no statistically significant difference. This table will help to reinforce this. You may wish to pause the video at this point and go through the table. For this test, the chi-squared, the test statistic chi-squared, equals the sum of the squares of the observed value minus the expected value divided by the expected value. For each category, each day of the week in our example, the test subtracts the expected frequency from the observed count, O minus E, squares it to make it positive, O minus E squared, divides by the expected value, O minus E squared, divided by E, and then sums these all up for the cells to get the chi-square test statistic as shown in this formula. Next, the test calculates the degrees of freedom, df equals k minus 1, where k is the number of categories of the variable, the six days of the week in our example. Uses df to identify the appropriate chi-square distribution. Uh, uses alpha and the distribution to calculate the critical value chi-square critical and compares chi-square to chi-square critical, or equivalently, equivalently compares p to alpha. If chi-square is greater than chi-square critical, or equivalently p is less than or equal to alpha, then there is a statistically significant difference, and there is not a good fit. So we reject h0, the null hypothesis. If chi-square is less than chi-square critical, or equivalently p is greater than alpha, there is not a statistically significant difference. There is a good fit, and we fail to reject or accept the uh, null hypothesis. Here's what it looks like graph graphically. The numerator, O minus E squared, in the test statistic formula makes it clear why the larger the difference between O and E, the larger the value of the chi-square test statistic. And therefore, the larger the difference between O and E, the larger the value of the chi-square test statistic. And so the farther to the right chi-square is on the graph above, the more likely it is that chi-square is greater than chi-square critical, and thus the more likely it is that chi-square is in the shaded region, which is the not a good fit range. And so the more likely it is there is not a good fit. In our bar uh, day of the week example, the degrees of freedom is 6 minus 1, or 5. The value of the test statistic chi-squared equals 9.96, and the critical value equals 11.07. So chi-squared is less than the critical value. This means there is a good fit. Chi-squared is in the white acceptance region, not the shaded rejectance region, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. You will recall from chi from K2 number 4, that the null hypothesis said there is no statistically significant difference. Okay, that concludes our discussion of the chi-square test for goodness of fit. This has been the third video in a playlist on statistical tes tests. Next are videos on the two other chi-square tests and one on non-parametric tests. You can always check the videos page on my website for the latest status of videos completed and planned. If you like this video, please remember to press the thumbs up like button on your screen below. I'll be making more videos of, of some or most of the 60 plus concepts in the book if folks like you tell me more videos are wanted. Please subscribe to this channel to be notified when new videos are uploaded. Also, the website statisticsfromazz.com has a listing of available and planned videos. Now, videos like this one can be very helpful but they're not very handy when you want to quickly look up something on the job 
while studying or during an open book exam. For that, nothing beats a book or an ebook. You can also learn more about those on the website. I'd recommend following my blog at statisticsomeatoz.com slash blog. I've got some things there that hopefully you will find interesting, like a statistics tip of the week series, as well as posts showing that you are not alone if you're confused by statistics. I'll also be posting on the Facebook page, Statistics from A to Z, and on Twitter as at, stated, at Stats A to Z.